Now, today is a day when I'm going to talk to you about something that's difficult. It's difficult for me. It's probably difficult for you. Uh, if it's not, I want to talk to you and I want to find out your secrets um, because it's probably one of the most difficult things it, really in life that we face. Um, and we face it over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us it's, it's impossible to master this thing that's so difficult, that it's impossible for us to be 100% to get it right all the time. The thing that I'm talking about is the tongue. And the problem that I'm talking about is you and I shoot our mouths off when we have no business shooting our mouths off, leaving destruction in our path, ruining relationships, damaging self-esteem. Uh, and um, instead of leaving grace behind, we leave a wake behind of emotional and relational damage. And oftentimes we don't mean to, and sometimes we do, but we talk too much. And sometimes the words that we choose are not the words that reflect well on Jesus. One of the things I want to discuss with you today is the fact that everything that we say, every word that comes out of our mouth reflects on Jesus. The way we talk to others reflects on Jesus because we say we're his followers. So his Holy Spirit has come and indwelled our life. And so the things we do and the way we act, well, it's a direct reflection on the person who we say is our master, our savior, our Lord, the person we're modeling our life after. And sometimes it's hard because we like to shoot our mouths off. Um, I like to shoot my mouth off and sometimes it hurts the people I'm closest to the most. I'm most responsible for my wife because she's the person who I'm closest to. She, I am most responsible or she, she is responsible for me as I am responsible for her because I'm the person that she's the closest to. We wake up next to each other in the morning, so I'm the most responsible for her and the words that I choose to say to her. And it works itself out in concentric circles. Maybe the kids who you see in the morning, maybe your adult children who you talk to or you text, maybe the coworkers you see when you show up at work, maybe your friends, your acquaintances, maybe the strangers that you bump into along the day. Words come out of our mouth and words have the ability to destroy. They have the ability to debilitate, to separate and just to make things difficult for us and for the people who are around us. And for some reason, I have a hard time getting it right because I just like to pop my mouth off. I don't know if any of you are the same way, but I wanna know if you're the same way. So if you sometimes get a little mouthy, um, would you mind raising your hand? Just look at me a little bit if you get a little mouthy. Okay, I, that's good, that's honest. In the first service, um, there were wives literally raising their husband's hands. There were more elbows thrown than a hockey match. I'm telling you, it was, it was ugly in here. They were calling people out for not being transparent. We all get a little mouthy. Just this morning, here I am in all of my preparation to speak to you. Um, my wife, we wake up and of course she looks out the window and she sees a little snow on the ground. And this is what she says. She says, are we going to have to shovel snow this afternoon? Now, that may not be an issue to you because if you're a guy here and you're married, I'm sure your wife gets out every single time it snows and shovels snow with you. But my wife has never shoveled snow. In my house, that's my job. And I don't like to shovel snow. And so when she got up and she said, are we going to have to shovel snow this morning? That was a fighting word to me. She was baiting me into having to let her know that she's never shoveled snow a moment in her life and that I'm the one who shovels snow and is she gonna go out? I wanted to set the record straight. I wanted to be right. I'm not gonna tell you if I did or didn't. It's none of your business, but I knew it was important because I was getting ready to come up here and talk to you about keeping my mouth shut. James talks about it. James, the half-brother of Jesus. James didn't follow Jesus during his, well, Jesus' life his half-brother but didn't believe Jesus was who he said he was, was somebody that didn't really come onto the scene of Christianity until after Jesus rose again and ascended into heaven. And then James, the half-brother of Jesus, pops onto the scene as the leader of the church of Jerusalem, one of the most prolific Christian leaders, but also one of the most Jewish leaders who still held on to a lot of the Judaism and a lot of the rules, but yet still genuinely believed in the resurrection and was a follower of Christ. He was a person who vehemently, aggressively, repeatedly, consistently talked about how Jesus rose from the dead and the Jewish establishment could not stand him for it. So history tells us, Josephus' account of church history, 
that there was a void or a vacuum in Roman government about 62 to 64 AD. And the high priest at the time who could not stand James got the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high council together, and they decided that James had to stop talking about the resurrection. And so they were going to kill him. And they stoned him until he was dead. He died for his faith. But before he died, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote a book and it's called James. And in this book, he talks about themes. One of the themes that he talks about is our relationship with each other and how the tongue is the gateway, the gatekeeper, a barometer for the condition of our heart and reminds us over and over again how important it is for us to be careful with what comes out of our mouth. Now, why am I talking about this at Christmas? Doesn't it seem weird? Because an untamed tongue can ruin your holiday. You're gonna be around people, many of you, who you don't see very often, some who irritate you. Some people have families and you don't always get along. There's somebody in that family maybe that you're just waiting to see and you know you're gonna be sitting next to them and they're gonna say something and it's gonna set you off. And it's so hard. You bite your tongue, you get elbowed under the table. But you know, you're probably like me and you'll say something that just makes you feel so good in the moment. And then all the way home, you're like, why did I have to open my big mouth? Taming the tongue. We're going into a holiday season where it's difficult. But if that isn't bad enough, you're going into a political season where it's even harder. And so I wanna take you to the book of James. Over the next three weeks, we're gonna be talking about this because I believe the best gift that you can give God this Christmas is a tamed tongue. The gift of control as to what comes out of your mouth. To let God characterize the impact that you have on the people closest to you. That we're responsible for every single word and that because we love him, we're giving him our words this Christmas season. So James, he starts off here in this section by my dear brothers and sisters. Now let's stop just for a second here. It doesn't sound unusual to you because um, brothers and sisters is a common way for us to introduce things. But back in Jesus' day, women did not have a whole lot of um, prominence in society. Now, Jesus was very much a person who came and elevated women. We see that all through the New Testament. But religion during that time, they had no use for women. Now, they had use for women as wives, raising children, uh, taking care of the homes. But as far as not even being able to testify in court, they were given like property to arrange marriages. There just wasn't a lot of respect back in this day. Jesus came to change that. And James, as he writes this section of scripture, and it's very peculiar, he says, not dear brothers, but he says, dear brothers and sisters. Now, one of the reasons he says sisters is because I believe that he is trying to recognize the importance and the value of women. But I also believe that he is saying sisters because perhaps women have just as much of an issue with this subject as men do. I'm not saying women have more of an issue with this subject than men do. I'm saying perhaps just as much. So he says, dear brothers and sisters, which already would have the hearers, the readers of this letter, it already would have had their attention. Take note of this. Make sure you listen to this. Understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. I could stop right here and say, church is dismissed, let's go to lunch. And if you embraced those words right there, that would be worth the price of admission this morning. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Anybody need to work on that? Is it just me? Okay, thank you. I really thought maybe it was just me and that was gonna make me feel really weird because you know you don't want it to be just you. I mean, obviously James thought it was an issue. It was an issue in the church. It was an issue with Christians back in his day. Certainly is an issue for us today. We're mouthy people and we think our opinions are more important and more valuable than anybody else. We have short fuses, we're irritated. We'll talk about that in just a minute. And he says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. Now there's three different levels of meaning for this. 
The first, James is talking about listening to the word of God. Be quick to listen to the word of God and slow to speak, saying that you know what it means and telling everybody else what to do. Slow to become angry. But the secondary meaning, and this is a transition kind of a thought or theme in this, this short book, is in our relationship with each other, with other Christians, and then thirdly, with those who aren't Christians but in the world, that we use the same principle. And he goes and illustrates this two more times in the book. And we'll talk about that next week and the week after. He says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. Can you say that with me together? Be quick to listen, slow to speak. I saw a pastor do this with his congregation. I liked it, so we'll do it together. He did hand motions like you're in elementary school. And I've actually done this this week, and it's helped me the times that I needed to be quick to listen and slow to speak. This morning, the whole snow shovel incident, there I am trying to do these motions, and Joy thought I lost my marbles because I hadn't shared the motions with her. But this, these are the motions, super simple. Be quick to listen, right? Because I want to embrace what you have, what you're telling me. I want to know, right? Slow to speak. Quick to listen. <sighs> slow to speak. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. Simple. Easy to say. Easy to remember. Hard to do. Why? We're supposed to become slow to anger because human anger, frustration. How can somebody be so wrong? I've just got to tell them what I think. I've got to set the record straight. I got to even the score. I got to get my two cents worth in. Human anger doesn't produce the righteousness that God desires. Righteousness is a real churchy word. And all that means is a right relationship with God and a right relationship with others. Because God is not nearly as concerned with us proving that we're right as he is showing that we're right with each other. Believing the truth is important. Living the truth is important. But just because it's true doesn't mean you have to say it. Saying it is about timing. It's about relationship. It's about sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. And for us to become irritable or to become angry, it's a direct enemy of the righteousness that God desires. So we're going to be quick to listen slow to speak, slow to become angry because being right with each other is far more important than me proving that I'm right in what I believe. Is that hard for anybody? I mean, you're going to be around some people this Christmas who installed your buttons. So of course it's easy for them to push your buttons and you know your buttons are getting pushed. And there are probably people in your family and maybe your friend group who just can't wait to push all of your buttons because they just think button pushing is a fun holiday tradition. They wanna mix it up. They wanna bait you to invite you in. But you're not gonna do that this year. You're gonna be quick to listen. And I do it like this because sometimes you gotta squeeze hard, right? I mean, quick to listen under the table. I'm listening, right? I'm listening. I don't like it. I don't like what you're saying, right? How could you be so wrong? But you know the truth? Everyone believes they're right. Everyone thinks they do the right things. Everyone who says things well, they think they're right. And so being quick to listen and slow to speak is the starting point to understanding. 
and understanding is one of the foundations of righteous relationships between God and us and us with each other. So we're gonna sing a couple of songs. And as we sing these songs, I wanna encourage you to think about your mouth. James talks about it like your tongue can set off a, a wild fire, unrestrained in the damage that it can do, unable to calculate the casualties along the way. Like an animal, impossible to tame, but needing to be bridled. Do you damage with your words? Do you give life and grace and peace and what you choose to say? When we talk, do people see Jesus? Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, for human anger doesn't produce the righteousness that God desires. But James, we live in a world that's irritating with people who I'm not even sure should be here, right? They don't think like I do. They don't act like I do. They don't believe the same things that I do. But we live in a world where people don't always act right, don't always believe the same things we do, don't always do the things we think they should do. We're guilty, sometimes they're guilty. Just the other day, we have uh, you know, Facebook posts where we put our uh, messages and worship services you know, online for people who can't be here. If you're joining us today, I'm glad you're joining us online. And you know, when you put something online, you sort of put yourself out there where people can comment if they wanna comment. And you expect most things to be relatively constructive and positive because most people are decent people. But every once in a while, you get somebody who will provoke you um, and provoke you to anger. And you have to, to begin to try to apply these things. It happened this last week when I was talking about my my granddaughter. And I told you guys that I didn't like to change diapers. Remember that? Well, somebody I think evidently heard that I don't know how to change diapers. And so they felt like they needed to comment on our Facebook page, which was very interesting. So they called me a nice name. We called him Don Quixote. We changed his name, but said, there's something wrong with you. If you can't change the diaper, you dip stick. Now he didn't actually say stick. You can figure out what he said and just chose to pop that out there and put that on, on Facebook and send it out into the universe. Now, what I said is we are responsible for the words we say, for the gestures that we make, for the facial expressions and body language, for the things that we type or voice to text, but we're provoked all the time. People are irritating. They're wrong and I'm right. Just the other day I was in West Des Moines. I don't recommend driving to West Des Moines November, December, stay away from West Des Moines. Every year I go and go, yep, still bad. If you live there, I'm glad you're here. You've escaped from West Des Moines. Don't go into Ankeny. Don't drive to Ankeny either. But I was driving. I was making a left-hand turn at a four-way stop, just minding my own business on a Saturday afternoon. And I was driving in the spirit, man. I was Christian driving, which isn't always the case. It was the case that day. Behaving myself, minding my own business, turning left, um, going slow. And this guy... Um, decided that he was going to run a stop sign and not stop his turn at a four-way stop. And so he laid on the horn, right? And I'm in the middle of the intersection. Joy's next to me. So I look over at him and I smile at him. Now that might've been provoking <laughs> because this guy kept laying on his horn. And the next thing you know, this was kind of a big guy. I know he couldn't fight for sure. All I saw was this face and the middle finger out the window and his hand was on the horn. And it must've lasted 15 seconds. And I can't tell you the last time I've been flipped off. Oh, it made me mad. I went from zero to 100. My wife was like, calm down. You need to go home right now. That's what she told me. We're not going to the mall. We're going home. You're out of control. And, and I just wanted to, there's just no, no limit to what I wanted to say. And in that moment, what I wanted to do. Other people are irritating. They can provoke us, but yet I'm still supposed to be quick to listen and slow to speak. But I mean, you know, am I any better? 
I wanted to blow my wife's morning up over a snow shovel and some misplaced words. Are you any better in the way you speak and how you conduct your relationships? The Apostle Paul writes about this in a book to the Philippians. My dad wrote a commentary on this book and he described the church and his relationship with Paul really very simply. Paul loved the church, the church loved Paul and he was just trying to tell them how to succeed. That's my paraphrase, to succeed in their relationship with the Lord. Now, the Apostle Paul, who used to be called Saul, who was a persecutor of Christians, wrote, and he was very concerned about the people in this church learning to be humble because humility is the foundation for being quick to listen and slow to speak. It's the foundation for human interaction and relationships, the foundation for unity in the church. It was not considered a virtue back in Jesus and James and the apostle Paul's day. Nobody would compliment you and say you're humble. They would think that that's a weakness, a deficiency in character. But the apostle Paul, he writes these words to this church about humility and it connects so well to this passage in James and what you and I are gonna be learning over these next three, three weeks. And he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. And your relationship with one another have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. So we wanna be like Christ because our words reflect on Christ. The way we interact reflects on Christ. And he gives us five different characteristics here. The very first one he says is that we are supposed to do nothing out of selfish ambition. Now, selfish ambition may not mean much to you in the English, but in the Greek, it literally means prickly. It means combative. It means just don't be so irritable. Um, like a porcupine, prickly. They can't help it, right? But they're prickly. Now, the apostle Paul, when he was Saul, was one of the most prickly people that you could ever imagine. He was a persecutor of Christians. He was self-righteous. He was a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin. His opinion was more important than anybody else's. What he had to say was all that mattered and people were gonna listen to him or else. Everything was a conflict, and he's writing not out of a strength, but out of a, a weakness, out of a brokenness over his past. And he's saying, listen, don't be so prickly and combative. Aristotle used the word to describe a politician who tears everybody else up, who argues and fights, who wins campaigns with all sorts of terrible um, underhanded means. That everything is a war. And Paul knew about this. As a matter of fact, he was the prickliest of them all, everybody. I thought of a rhyme earlier in the first service. Saul, before Paul, was the prickly and porcupinest of them all. You like that? Saul before Paul was the porcupiniest of them all. So he knew. He was like, I was there. I was the worst. Everything was a fight. It was all win-lose. It was me or you. And he starts off by saying, don't be so prickly. And then next he goes and he develops this thought and he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Vain conceit means it's all about me. Pure selfishness. I want the experiences. I want to win. You're going to lose. You're going to give me the experiences. This can be in conversation. It can also be in relationship. Parents of adult kids who are out of the home, we have to be really careful about this because sometimes even in the holidays, we put so much pressure on our kids to give us the experiences that we want that we make our adult kids and their starting and budding families miserable and feeling conflicted over where they're gonna be and who they're gonna be with because it's us, we want the experiences but yet we don't want to give the experiences to them, allowing them to create their own. This trickles down in every area of life. I wanna have a good Christmas. I wanna get what I want. I want what I want to eat and where I want to eat it and when I want to eat it. I wanna sit by the fire. I don't wanna sit by cousin Larry. I don't have a cousin Larry, but you know what I mean, right? What if we are into giving experiences, not demanding experiences? What if we decide to make our interactions about other people and not just about us? What if we're willing to give a little away 
instead of try to take everything back. So the Apostle Paul says, quit being the prickliest, porcupiniest of them all. Don't be so demanding, collecting and hoarding experiences because you want them, not giving them to other people, not even giving them the ability to be heard. You gotta stop. And then he says, he goes on and he says, rather in humility, value yourselves or others above yourself. Now, humility isn't about thinking less about yourself, right? We know that. Humility isn't talking about, oh, I'm a terrible person. You know, I'm so incapable. I'm so unlovable. That's ego. A really bad self-esteem and it's a preoccupation with self. It's just a different form of selfishness. Humility is not thinking less about yourself. It's just thinking about yourself a little less often. You know what? I'm just not gonna think about me quite so much. I'm gonna think about you today. God, not how can I receive a blessing. God, today, how can I be a blessing? So simple, but yet so revolutionary. And how would your marriage change if that was your philosophy? How would your parenting change if you really did that in what you say and how you interact? How would your work relationships blossom and grow? Your friendships, even the people you bump into throughout the day, the ones who you can say whatever you want to and there's no repercussions back on you. Rich Mullins was an artist, Christian artist who died back in the 80s. And he wrote a song called May Mercy Lead. And the lyrics of this song have a lot to do with humility and they have a lot to do with staying away from prickliness and selfishness. And he says, may mercy lead, may love be the strength in my legs, and with every footstep that I take, may I leave a drop of grace. Now I change those and can say, with every word that I speak, may I leave a drop of grace. What if our words build up and don't tear down? What if we're not so preoccupied about proving that we are right? I want you to know I'm right. I want everyone to know I'm right. I want the world to hear that I'm right. What's the big deal? Paul goes on and he says, listen, this is hard. It's hard for me. It's hard for you. Don't look just into your own interests, but into the interest of others. And your interactions with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. When you speak, our words reflect on Jesus. People think, set their opinions form conclusions on Jesus. If you say you're a follower of Christ on the words that come out of our mouths, it's as if Jesus were speaking these words himself. So am I reflecting Christ in the things that I say? Beginning with those closest to me and working themselves out in concentric circles. Wow, my goodness. I was talking to the deacons last Tuesday and I uh, told them we were gonna be teaching this series that I was going into three weeks on this. And I explained what we were doing and I said, isn't this gonna be fun? And they said, no, it's not gonna be fun. I'm like, well, what guys, I shouldn't teach this. This has never happened before. They said, no, no, you have to teach this. This is awesome. It's just not gonna be fun. This is hard. We don't wanna hear it. We are not going to want to have to do this because they're honest. Because when we think about it, when we talk about it, we are accountable to it. And the greatest gift that we can give the Lord this Christmas and the people closest to us is a tame tongue. You do not have to take every stage to prove how right you are. Even if you've been waiting to see people for an entire year just to tee them up so that you can convince them of your truth. Paul says, consider the interest of others, not just your own and be like Jesus. When we say, I have no idea how somebody could think that way. I have no idea how somebody could be that ignorant. I have no idea why they would say what they said. I better respond. We're going to be quick to listen and slow to speak because when we have no idea, it means we don't understand. Because once again, everyone does what makes sense to them. So I wanna understand you. 
even if I disagree with you. Because understanding and humility are foundations of our interpersonal relationships. First, our relationship with God, second, with each other in our church, and third, between us and the world. And it's just getting harder and harder and harder for us as we live in a world that seems to escalate. And all our relationships with one another be like Jesus. All right, I can't do it. Help me, God, because I can't do it. I couldn't even make it through the morning without being tempted. You probably can't even make it through your ride home without being tempted. You may be irritated right now and you can't wait to get out of this room so that you can be unthoughtful and unrestrained in your words. We need God's help. And so I came up with a prayer that I've been praying this week that I'm going to pray the next two weeks as you and I work through this fun project together and learn to watch our words. Let me share this prayer with you. It starts with a scripture, which is a good way to start. King David, the Psalms, the Psalms are full of prayers, not necessarily promises, but prayers, concepts, principles. And as this Psalm is prayed, I wanna share it with you and I want you to make this part of your own prayer life. If you're interested in doing this, set a guard over my mouth over my gestures, over my expressions, over my phone, over my keyboard. Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips because if you don't keep watch, ain't nobody watching. Help me, God, right? I need it. You need it. We need it. Because if left to ourselves, we don't reflect very well on Jesus with the things we say. So this is my prayer. God, please keep me from being critical, judgmental, or from saying things that I regret. Fill me with kindness and grace. Help me to be quick to listen and sincerely try to understand. I accept that my words are a reflection on Jesus. And when I speak, I need your help. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. For human anger is an enemy of the right relationship with God that God desires and our right relationship with each other. In all of our relationships, I'm not going to be prickly or self-focused. I'm gonna to choose to think about you more than me. I'm gonna consider your experience as every bit as or more important than mine and I'm going to be a giver, not a taker. I wanna understand what you have to say and I wanna respect your opinion. And when I speak, I wanna speak words of grace and words of love that lead through relationship to words of truth. And I need God's help. So that's what I'll be praying for you. You pray this for me. And together by God's grace, maybe what we say will point people toward our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the time that we've spent together. And this is a hard subject, Father. It was hard for the disciples, Peter in particular. Obviously, it was an issue for James. We know that Paul struggled with it. So if some of the best Christians who've ever lived, they struggle with these things, and of course, it's gonna be an issue for us. We know you tell us through the book of James that we'll never have 100% mastery over this, that it's never gonna be something we put in our rear view mirror but you also tell us to work on it, to be serious about it, to continue to offer it to you, to use our tongues, our bodies, our mouths as instruments of righteousness, even in times where tension is high. So I pray for this season where we will be in close contact with 
people who maybe we don't see very often and sometimes people we have a hard time understanding. For those who are going to be in contact with people who just wanna push their buttons. Where ongoing years of tension have continued, sometimes under the surface and maybe sometimes not so much. I pray, Father, that you would allow us to be people who speak words of grace, words of love, words that reflect well on Jesus. I pray that as we live in a world, in a country that escalates right now with the political season continuing to grow and opinions and tensions high, that the things that we say, the way we listen, how we interact is Christ-like, reflects well on Jesus with the things that are going on in our world today, with the wars, the upheaval, the unrest, that we would be people who hang tight, close, live the truth, but we're also people who seek to understand, to build and not tear, to encourage, to nudge. And I pray, Father, that most of all, as has been the theme for our morning. We are quick to listen, slow to speak. When we speak, our words are your words. So give them to us in Jesus' name, amen.